a question about who gets to name the seamount. Um, I don't have the list of organizations in front of me, but um, there are several different organizations and um, uh, what are they called? Uh, cultural organizations that um, will get together and make proposals and decide on a name as like a, a, a board team effort, not just one person that gets to name the seamounts. What's this thing right in the middle? Is it an old base? Zoom in, please. Yeah, I think you're right. It could be an old base from a coral. Yeah, that's what it looks like. Cool. Okay, come on. So there's a Ritogorgia, Stichopathes, Candidella gigantea. Still quite a few corals along this... Uh, Downslope. Getting steeper now. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Got a question in the chat about why the oxygen saturation would be increasing as we're heading downward. Good why observation. It, why is it decreasing as we're heading? Increasing. Oh, it's increasing as we're heading downward. So um, the oxygen profile actually changes with depth. So near the surface, you're going to have really high oxygen concentration because there's a lot of mixing with the air at the surface. And then uh, it's going to drop down to an oxygen minimum somewhere in the midwater. Um, that's where a lot of life is, is consuming a lot of that oxygen. So you're going to you're going to have that reduction of oxygen as you head down lower. There's going to be a, a slow, steady rise in the oxygen concentration as you approach the, the sea floor. So it kind of makes this, uh, I, it's hard to describe what the shape looks like, um, kind of like a backwards seven from high to low, back up a little bit again heading down to a, a stable concentration. And, and that's because these different water masses have different um, concentrations of oxygen. Um, water near the bottom of the really deep ocean is um, Antarctic bottom water that was formed, was at the surface in Antarctica and uh, it then sinks low down because it's, it's very dense and cold and it travels along the, the bottom of the ocean. Um, and so we have different types of water called water masses in the ocean, and they all have kind of unique characteristics about them. And they all have different oxygen concentrations, but mainly oxygen concentration will change with the amount of biology that's consuming oxygen in the area. Um, and that's why near the surface you have that um, lower oxygen concentration. So this is an Oridogorgia. We had a nice little look down the spiral. That was gorgeous. Oh, there's a Metallogorgia. I think we need to be on our way, but sorry, we might see a, see another one later. Metallogorgias are, are pretty cosmopolitan throughout the world's oceans. We see them all over the place on seamounts. C 
Team Blue Water is at it again, enjoying this blue water. But it's very reassuring to know that there's a bottom just below us. So how are we uh, navigating, um, Trevor, when can't really see much? Can't see. Hmm? How are you navigating? How am I navigating? Yeah. I'm just going where Aaron says. Just point and go. Oh. Uh, I mean, we know, we know we're going down slope. We don't expect any surprise spires, though there is that pretend spire there in the high pack. What is, where are we going? We're going down here. This is nothing. Just, I'm looking at this screen. This one. Oh, that? Sorry, yeah. I averted my eyes for a second. And the yeah, I get thinking. The, the ghost ship went away. So, good question. Where is the ship going at this moment? Doesn't look like 208 to me. No. I'm not, not sure. sure why that's happening, because it's the second time that happened now. So last time I just called in another move. That's what I'm going to try again. Okay. Bridge nav. Uh, what What's going on with the DP where, like, the, the goal ship kind of disappears? Are we still on a move? Okay. Um, if if it helps, it'd be good to type in another one zero zero meter move two zero eight, um, or check if that's what you need to do. But keeping an eye on it. Yeah, it's not really moving to zero eight. So if you could, it's going about two four zero. It looks like um, if you can maybe dial in another move because that's that's a little too sharp of a angle for what we want. Okay, sounds good. Like literally, just looked away to look at you. <laughs> it's like. <laughs> Nope. <laughs> Do we have a moment for an Argus question? <laughs> you just drive the bus. And now which direction are we going? Down uh, slope and west. <laughs> Very much west. Um, but he's restarting the DP, so we're right. just going to have to drift for a little while. Yeah, we might just end up making a little bit of a, a circle. Hmm. The upside is uh, we're nicely, um, hopefully safely above the bottom here. So at the summit. There isn't any cliffs to run into. We're at the very, very top. Where's that sand coming from? Did you kick up some sediment with the down No, or? I swear I didn't. <laughs> Meaning I definitely did. <laughs> oh my gosh, we're going to fall into the hole in the data. Uh-oh. Oh no. No. I hope it's a real spire. It's not. <laughs> I know, but imagine if it was. 
That would be really cool. That'd be awesome. Look at this spire right here. It's actually, I think, a down spike too, so it's very unexpected. Oh, it's a pit. Yeah, it's a, it's a hole. Can the pit of the despair? Hole? Apparently. Apparently. The pit of DP despair, perhaps. That's what DP stands for. Despair. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great rock, though. It is a great rock. It's yeah. behind where we are going, but this it's is a wonderful rock. It's where I am, so it's, it's where you're going right now, like it or not. Have a look at that thing and then go this way. Not that way, though. Oh boy. I do hope this comes back soon. Yeah. I don't like these anxious moments of windows. Can, can we zoom out on high back, please? Yep. Oh yeah, that's fine. Also, 1600 UTC. Just remember that number. Right, things could get different and better, or just different. Better and better. <laughs> oh man, quite the excursion we're going on here, friends. For those of you just tuning in, we are exploring uh, unnamed Seamount G. We are currently transiting from the most shallow summit to another summit, but at the moment we're in a downslope as we head along a ridge, making our way to the next summit. And going on a little field trip as we reposition the ship. Got a biology question. The ROV pilots do their thing. Are there any events that happen in deep ocean that can kill coral, like the larger scale events? Sorry, were you asking a question up front? We're just uh, trying to keep an eye on things. Nope, I was asking a bio question, actually. Oh, okay. okay, cool. What was the question? Are there any uh, like large scale events that can happen in the deep ocean that would affect or kill coral? Um, I, well, probably. So if you are on an active volcano, for example, you could have uh, a lava flow that could take out a coral community. Um, but in terms of, you know, fluctuation in temperature, that's going to be unlikely. So uh, in the deep sea, the temperature st stays very steady all year round. Um, 
unlike in shallow water coral reefs where you might have a change in temperature that causes coral bleaching or a storm that might damage corals, you're just not going to see that type of uh, large-scale damage uh, in the deep ocean. It's, it's pretty protected down here from those types of, of um, disturbance events. Maybe a impact event? Hmm? Maybe an impact event would kill corals. Pretty oh. sure that if it got to the deep sea, it would impact not just the corals. But yeah, yeah. If we had like a, a meteor come down and and kill off a bunch of deep sea corals, we might have more problems mm -hmm. than than just that. But an impact event would probably only uh, disturb something locally, um, unless it kicked up a bunch of sediment that could suffocate. Uh, animals far away. So that's one of the concerns about deep sea mining is that um, the mining activity will impact more than just what's around uh, the mining site. Yeah. Um, okay. So sediment like re like resuspension is an issue for deep sea corals. Absolutely. Okay. Definitely. Yeah, if there's too much sediment, um, it can basically suffocate these animals that are living in, in the deep sea. Um, the sediment will suffocate corals, they'll, they'll suffocate uh, animals that are living in the water column. So too much sediment is not a good thing. Yeah. Someone in the chat was suggesting a viral pathogen, kind of like when something kills off like a species of corn or something like that. Um, yeah, um, coral viruses in the deep sea it definitely are not a well-studied thing. So um, we probably wouldn't even notice if that were to happen just because of how little we know about this environment. We're still really just in that exploration phase. There have been some studies to a little bit better understand how the communities form, develop over time. But... There is a lot of work to be done to learn more about what kind of things impact the deep sea and, and especially uh, vi viruses and pathogens and how that might impact these animals. It's definitely uh, something that has not really been looked into. Here's something that might also not have been looked into. Uh, the question is, if a lava flow flows over corals, would they break down or would they be engulfed and potentially preserved? Do we know? Um, they would be burned. Lava is very, very hot, um, and it wouldn't be preserved. Thinking like there a are some situation. volcanic eruptions that can preserve, like, people and stuff, so... Um, are we talking like Pompeii? Yeah, exactly, like Pompeii, but it was ash. Right. It wasn't, like magma that was covering them but it yeah. was volcanic ash that covered them you're not gonna get ash in the no, ocean you're not gonna get ash here <laughs> yeah it's also a different type of volcano so mm -hmm. those are more silicic volcanoes and what we get in the ocean are saltic Yep, got an eye on it. Um, last I heard they were, and they are changing heading. I'm watching them change heading. They're doing that manually, but we're continuing to drift while they do that. I 
I have no indication of current. Uh, the wind is at about 20 knots. Once we get well over 20, it becomes, well, between 20 and 25, we start to get sketchy. Um, but that is all the information I could tell you right now. Megan, what seat are you in? Yeah. Got a very relevant question in the chat. Have we ever come across any odd bones on the deep sea floor? Uh, what was the uh, uh, skull that we just found on the last uh, last? Um, there, yeah, there was uh, the skull of a beaked whale that they found during one of the dives on the last expedition. Yeah. So it happens. Yeah, um, definitely something that you can find. Uh, there are a number of whale falls that are known uh, near California where people have returned multiple times to observe how that changes over time, that how the community that's feeding off that whale fall uh, develops and, and changes as it's consumed, which is pretty interesting. Uh, but again, the, the ocean's a really, really big place, so finding things like that can be challenging. Sort of a luck of the draw. You never know what you're going to find on one of these expeditions. There's always something new and ex interesting. And to clarify for those of you at home wondering if we are ascending in blue water. We're not, actually. We're very near the seafloor. We just happen to be going, uh, at, uh, traversing a downslope, so there's not much to see at the moment. Unless something swims by. We'll, we'll find out.
we're just sorting some things out. Um, question how much time is left in the dive. We're doing approximate 24 hour dives. Um, this is a much more open exploration uh, expedition. So um, we will see, we're watching the, the wind and the weather and you know, seeing what is to see down here. So we will find out. Yeah, we don't we don't have that much much more time left in this dive. Uh, on our whiteboard upstairs, we had an approximate on ship time around eight, between eight and noon. So we're getting close. We are at the top of the sea mount, and we're gonna go explore the the second summit. So we are at the summit, and then there are these two high points on the summit. So we just explored one high point, and now we're going to check out the other one. Yeah, so on the whiteboard it said uh, between 8 and noon. So I'm not, sh yeah, pretty big expanse of when they wanted to come up, um, so I'm not sure. Sounds good, like a, a good plan. That was what my thinking was gonna be too. Let's just continue with the dive until you're told otherwise. Just team blue water making blue water on the seafloor. Just, just skilled like that. We are skilled like that. I uh, question about uh, the electrical systems. Um, are fish repelled by the uh, electrical systems? Do you think? Um, no, they, I don't think they are repelled by the electrical system. I know that some sharks have electrical. They, yeah, they can people. sense it, yeah. and that's why I think sometimes the, the sharks and some fish might be interested in checking out the ROV. Oh, kind of an opposite reaction. Yeah, uh, and some other animals might be avoiding the ROV, but it doesn't harm them in any way.
had a request earlier to talk about some sea life as a life at sea while we were hanging out in blue water. How is everybody sleeping with these choppy waves? I actually sleep pretty well on the ship. I kind of like the motion. I do too, although my berth is oriented so that I'm tipping head to toe rather than like being rocked side to side. So it was a little interesting to get used to. Yeah, same here. I promise you rocking side to side is much better than rocking head to toe. I agree. Rocking head to toe is the weirdest sensation. <laughs> I feel like the rocking of the boat puts me into REM sleep much faster. Because even when I only sleep for a couple hours, I know that I, I have a dream. So, And that's when you get good sleep, is when you get into REM, the yep. REM cycle. So I'm not sure how it's happening so quickly, because it normally takes you, like, what, three hours to get into REM? But the rocking makes it go quicker. And there's also like constant noise on the ship, like kind of a whirring, kind of like you're on a, an airplane. Yeah, so it's also... like, you know, like your white noise machine, mm -hmm. just, you know, ship noise machine. Yeah, it definitely, even when I do have uh, longer stretches of time to get some sleep, I find that my body like is just kind of done sleeping uh, in less time, probably because of what you're mentioning, Coralie, we're just falling into REM sleep a little faster. I'm sad. I have a Fitbit, and a cool thing about the Fitbit is it tracks your sleep mm -hmm. um, based on your breathing patterns. And I didn't bring it, and I kind of wish I did so oh, I could yeah. track my sleep and how quickly I'm getting into REM. Another cool thing about it, though, is it gives you a sleep score, which is always a fun thing. Because I'm always you. trying to get a high sleep score. <laughs> <laughs> Who can sleep the best? <laughs> Does it give you like shade about not sleeping well one night? It doesn't give you shade, but like having a sleep score of like 50 or something, you know, makes you feel bad. Having a sleep score of 90 feels awesome. And one of the comments, this is true, um, we're in a high activity uh, excitement environment and it tires your brain out pretty quick. This is true, but also uh, the constant movement of the ship, your body is constantly making adjustments. So you're not just sitting on a couch, you're like constantly bobbing around and that's a lot for your body to handle. So it does make you tired. It's like a, a good workout, mm -hmm. just trying to stand still. Great for the little stabilizer muscles and, and the big stabilizer muscles on some of these rocky days. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's why I don't go to the gym, because I'm working out just by doing nothing. Yeah, just, you know, nope. walking up and down stairs. Nope, you're not going to get away with that one. We have a gym sign up. Your name is nowhere on it. No, it's not. Yeah, walking up the stairs. is. We were talking about this yesterday, I think. It's fun, because, you know, you're so light, and you're just bouncing up the stairs, and then suddenly, like, the weight of the world is crushing you down. <laughs> Not sure if you're going to make that last step. It's really challenging if you're carrying something. Always leave a hand for the ship. Always. Here's a bio question. If it's so dark, then why do fish, some fish, have eyes? Um. So, yeah. It is dark down here, but that doesn't mean there isn't any light. A lot of organisms produce their own light uh, in the form of bioluminescence. So having eyes can be advantageous if, if you are looking for that light uh, produced by other animals. You can, find, you can use bioluminescence to find prey items. You can use your bioluminescence to find... Uh, other animals of your same species for mating purposes. There's a lot of uses for light in the deep ocean. It just not coming from the surface. 
But there are some fish that don't have eyes at all, correct? Absolutely. There's definitely some uh, blind fish down here that don't have any eyes at all. Um, there's a blind cusk eel called Teflonis. Um, there's a, a blind lizard fish called uh, Bathy Tiflops. Just to name a couple fish off the top of my head that I know that don't have eyes. There's definitely more. Um, and we might see some, but I think we're a bit shallow for some of our eyeless fish. I bet there are a number of midwater fish that, you know, I can't even think of that might fall into that category too, since we're staring at, at the midwater. Technically. <laughs> oh, look, there's a cute little jelly. Oh, look at him go. Bloop, bloop. Here's a great mapping question. Actually, I'm not, not sure if it's a mapping question or a team leader question. Uh, when a sea map has been mapped, um, how do scientists determine which side to traverse in order to get the biology or geology they're interested in? Uh, that's a good question. So it depends on what kind of study you're doing. Uh, we like to target areas that we think are going to have high density communities or really interesting biological communities. So if I was to choose where to dive on a seamount, uh, I'd look at what the prevailing current is in the area likely on the surface. That usually will tell you which side of the seamount will have a lot more sediment than the other. Or um, another good way to choose a dive site is by looking at what kind of ridges and interesting topo top topographical features there are. So if you find a nice, really interesting topographical feature, something like a pinnacle or a ridge, that might be a really cool thing. To check out. Just circled a, a jelly hanging out with us. So for today's dive, we um, decided to go up the flank of this seamount to traverse to the summit. Um, depending on what your study is, uh, you might start at a different depth. We just went to a nice deep depth, about 3,500 meters, uh, and making our way to the, the summit of the seamount, which is around 1,800 meters. So we did a sort of like a transect up the side of this seamount. So if you were looking for very, something very specific, you might run transects along a depth contour. Say if you were looking for a specific species and you know that its depth range, you would probably just survey that area. So no area of a seamount is really, you know, a bad place to survey, but there might be some areas on a seamount that you might not want to go to just for logistical reasons. Some areas like between two high ridges aren't as safe for the ROV to work. So you might avoid an area like that. And that's where uh, dive planning comes in to the equation. Uh, scientists will think of a dive plan, what they want to do, what they want to see, and they're going to run it by the ROV team to confirm that it's something that the vehicle is capable of doing. Speaking of the ROV, do we have time for a hurt question? Yeah. Right. Um, does Hercules maintain its position if the pilot is not giving it input? Kind of like you have like a, a cruise control or like a, you know, a, what's it called? Hold station function. If we're on the bottom, yeah, it does. A bunch of different sensors that 
when you push the right buttons, will hold it in place. Uh, but it needs to be near the bottom for some of the sensors to work. In the midwater, it can hold heading and depth, but it can't hold a horizontal position. And for our sampler, is, are there any elusive items that you've never managed to sample because they always get away from you? If you think about that sea pen that was <laughs> kept slurping down into the sediment. Never slurped a whale. <laughs> well, have you ever tried? <laughs> no. <laughs> You're right. I should just try. You should just. That is not what I said. <laughs> <laughs> You're You're absolutely right. I should try. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I don't know, it's hard to slurp fish. Or uh, shrimp. Shrimp can be particularly difficult to sample. I can't remember if I've sampled a shrimp or not. Well, especially those like red Aristide shrimp that we were seeing. Those can be really challenging because they're very fast. I definitely sampled... Uh, Squat lobsters, swimming squat lobsters and crinoids. Yeah, the crinoids aren't as strong swimmers, so they can't undulate away fast enough. No. The secret of a squat lobster is to sneak up from behind. Oh yeah, so they scoot right into exactly. the suction sampler. Tricky. Oh, that didn't work. There's a jelly. Are you jelly fishing? Yeah, I'm jelly fishing. <laughs> you what? Hello. Got a current question. Uh, we are currently <laughs> we are currently watching the uh, the wind um, on the surface. But does the current the surface current uh, coincide with the deep sea current that we're experiencing? Is there any correlation there? Do we know? Is there a correlation between what we see as the surface current current and what the currents are down there? Yep, that is the question that they ask. Um, no, not necessarily at all. Um, and th the current that we see is just a, it's kind of an est derived or estimated current based on the forces. We don't have any direct measurement of current, even at the surface. Um, and then, yeah, as we get deep, currents change completely. And we only know, we have some indication just based on what um, Trevor is able to do with Herc as far as moving around. Argus question, is Argus able to hold position the way that Herc does? Um, no, so Argus's position is controlled by the ship um, in XY. So it doesn't have any of the bottom tracking sensors um, that can allow Herc to do auto XY. Um, 
and similarly with depth, the depth is controlled by the winch, so there's no auto depth or auto alt altitude feature based on the sensors. It's just all um, based on the positioning of the winch. Argus is more like a a weight than yo-yo. Yeah, yeah, a yo-yo, a weighted yo-yo. Remember when yo-yos were all the rage, like? 20 years ago, was it even? Yeah, about 20 years ago. That's a real yo-yo epidemic. What's that? I didn't.
if you are just tuning in. If you are just tuning in, we are currently traversing from the shallowest summit of unnamed seamount G to another point, another summit along the flank. Well, oh, can we zoom on, on whatever that is? Yeah, probably. Let's find out. It just looks weird. Go ahead, Aaron. Good luck. <laughs> oh, it's a siphonophore. Ah. Cool. Good job, Aaron. We caught it. Well, since we're in the midwater, we might as well, you know, catch some animals. And every time I say unnamed seamount, G, someone asks, what is the process for naming a seamount? Um, so it's going to go to several different uh, committees, cultural, cultural committees, um, and I don't know who gets to submit names, but um, there, there are just several committees that it, uh, the naming process goes through before they decide collectively on a name for a seamount. I don't think just anyone can uh, submit a name. Yeah, definitely not. You have to have a reason behind the name. question about all this lovely blue water. How much life sits in this kind of blue zone? I think it depends on what part of the uh, ocean you're in, right? So the question is how much life is in the midwater? But obviously you have benthic communities on the seafloor and of course the photic zone all way up above, but what sort of uh, mid, uh, what, what about this sort of midwater column environment? Well, there's a, there's a lot of life in the midwater, lots and lots of life. It doesn't look like much because we're only looking at a very, very small amount of it. Um, there are lots of different types of fish, lots of different types of jellies. Um, there's lots of planktonic animals that are living here that we're just not even seeing. 
So there is a whole ecosystem within the midwater. This is the largest biome on the planet. And the most abundant vertebrate on the planet is a fish called Cyclothony, and that lives in the midwater. We might end up seeing one if we hang out here long enough. <laughs> 